So what we're talking about this morning and the next couple of classes is the imperfect competition. So we've gone through all the extremes. Now we've looked at the competitive market and the implications of the competitive market and how that works. We've looked at the monopoly market and how that works. And now we're looking at the in-between area. So really when we talk about imperfect competition, we're talking about two major types of competition or defined types of competition. And that would be a oligopoly, which is close to a monopoly. An oligopoly means that there are a couple or three suppliers of the product, more than one, but not a lot. And uh, monopolistic competition, which is more close to competition side, monopolistic competition really means that, yeah, we might only have a few sellers, but there's a lot of substitutes for the product. So, for example, airlines, well, if I don't fly, I can drive. Or if I don't drive, I could take a bus. Or if I don't take a bus, I could take a train. So that's what we mean by competitors out there that are not direct competitors, but indirect competitors. So that's really what that's focused on. So this unit really continues with our discussion market structures and to describe how trade occurs between buyers and sellers. So it's really looking at that interaction. And um, so, you know, we talked about the buyer dominated, which is perfectly competitive. We've talked about the seller dominated, which is the monopoly. And now we've got these, these in-between ones. So we're looking at the characteristics of really the buyer dominated by imperfect competition, or as I like to call it, competition in the real world. The, the real, this is more reflectant of the real world. We don't have perfectly, perfectly competitive markets. Most markets are somewhere in this imperfect competition spectrum. So it occurs when an individual firm, by virtue of its size relative to the market, has only some degree of control, not a lot of the control. Like, for example, monopoly, the seller has absolute control because the firm was the industry. And in the competitive market, the firm had no control whatsoever because there were so many competitors. The market was really in control. In this one, the firm has some degree of control, but not complete over the industry and the quantity supplied and the price. So in Canada, for example, all we need to do is look at department stores. The traditional department store that existed in the 60s really doesn't exist anymore in, in a true sense of the world. But the closest we can find is Walmart. And Walmart came into Canada in the mid-1990s, and they immediately grabbed about 30% of the market share. Because the fact was that they brought up Wilco or Woolworths, and they kind of moved into their spaces. So they had instant instant awareness in Canada. And also, they were pretty well brand aware because the fact of the matter is, is the majority of Canadians live within 200 kilometers of the U.S. border. And going across the border is sort of like a national pastime before COVID. So everybody was super familiar with Walmart. So Canadian Tire is another good example that have a large chunk of the market. You know, if we look at another type of store that, sort of competes with Walmart as close as possible. Canadian Tire is another example. Uh, Eaton's in the Bay used to be. They met their demise, so Zeller's met its demise. So we see, uh, we see over the last probably 20 years, that market has really kind of narrowed down to a couple of large sellers. And now we have the online world of Amazon and companies similar to Amazon taking a huge, huge chunk of the market. Uh, I went over to the post office the other day, and you can kind of, if you go into the post office and you look at the packages that are there, you get a good sense on how much Amazon has really drawn into the market when you look at the number of parcels there from Amazon. If you look at grocery suppliers in Canada, you know, or in Eastern Canada in particular, Loblaws really dominates the market with uh, it's Dominion brand or the Atlantic Superstore in in um, in um, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI. And when we're talking about Ontario, we're really talking about Loblaws. And Sobeys has gained a big foothold into the Canadian market now. Sobeys is based in Stellarton, Nova Scotia, and uh, they're uh, they're kind of all over the place as well. But again, you know, you can count the the number of grocery stores or the brands of grocery stores on one hand in Canada, considering that a lot of the grocery stores are owned by the same company. Foodland, for example, is owned by Sobeys and uh, they've, the um, 
the one that's here, the, I call it Easy Save, easy, easy, but I'm not sure what it's called now. It's, uh, anyway, the other store that's owned by Dominion. So non-traditional retailers such as online retailers, Amazon, are eating in their, their market shares. And it, you know, it's, it's not really a competitive market because we can say that really if we look at it, there's only a handful of sellers and those sellers are very much in control of the situation, particularly if you look at Walmart. So you can see this type of continuum here that I've drawn out. And uh, it's not level, but probably as good as I can do. The, um, the pure competition is on one extreme, the monopoly is on the other extreme. And if we look in the middle, we've got monopolistic competition and the oligopoly. Now, monopolistic competition really is signified by a large number of relatively small firms. Now, the definition of relatively small is, is loose because Ontario relatively small is very large in Newfoundland, right? So it really depends on the market you're in, what you define as really small. Really small means that they don't have any real influence over the market. There's lots of freedom of entry and exit. There's some control over price because there are relatively few of them. And they have differentiated products. In Canada, the airlines are a good example of monopolistic competition. You know, uh, if we fly anywhere, we're normally flying on one of three airlines. You're flying on Air Canada you're flying on WestJet, or you're flying on Porter. And really, if we think about it, you know, they're relative to firms in the United States, such as West, uh, such as Southwest or, or American Airlines and these sorts of things, they're relatively small. Um, there's lots of freedom of entry and exit. Anyone can start an airline in Canada. And in fact, I think that there's a new one starting very shortly. And they have some degree of control over price. I think if you've tried to buy an airline ticket lately, you're going to know that they have some degree of control over price. And differentiated products. What do they try to do? Well, WestJet was very good at this many years ago. It doesn't really apply so much anymore. But what WestJet tried to do was differentiate itself from Air Canada. They, they used to consider themselves as a more user-friendly airline, more laid back. You know, if you get on a WestJet flight, for example, they like to tell jokes uh, on the, when they're doing the announcements and these sorts of things. Air Canada doesn't tend to do that. It tends to be very, very stiff. So that's how they really differentiate themselves. They used to differentiate themselves on new airplanes. WestJet had relatively new aircraft, whereas Air Canada's were older. And now Air Canada is renewing their fleet. They probably can't say that anymore as WestJet planes get older and the Air Canada ones get newer. But the fact of the matter is they try to differentiate in the eye or the mind of the consumer as opposed to reality. Because even if you go to St. John's, you'll look that WestJet gets in the same time as Air Canada. The flights all land and take off within 10 minutes of one another. So there's not a big difference in terms of it. And when you sit in the seat, the amount of service that you get is about the same vote. The, uh, the oligopoly on the other side, uh, the oligopoly, again, very limited number of of sellers, um, dominated by a few large firms. Entry can be difficult. Now, the airline industry in Canada, you know, you could argue instead of monopolistic competition, it's more like an oligopoly. And that's true. It depends on where you are and how you look at it. Um, again, you got a limited number. It's hard to get into the airline business because it's very expensive. It's a very capital intensive business. Um, price competition, if you go look at what price of tickets now, if you go on any one of the, the uh, Expedia or whatever, you'll see that the tickets aren't that much different. And they have a high degree of control over price. And they're mutually interdependent. If we think about companies like the rental car companies, they tend to be mutually interdependent. If they run out of cars, they'll send you over to the other company. These are good examples of oligopoly. As I say, it's a gray line between two of these. The real key difference is a monopolistic tends to have differentiation as the key to differentiating them. Oligopoly tends to be, we're just so big that we have a large control over the market. So firms operating in perfectly competitive environments tend not to compete so much on price. Rather, these firms often try to carve out a piece of their consumers mind by making them stand out relative to their competitors. So we want to be able to kind of make your company stand out 
be a little flashier, be a little bit different, do something a little bit different. And the most common way this is done is through product differentiation, which by definition is an attempt by a firm to distinguish its product from that of its competitors by doing such things as developing a recognized brand name, Tim Hortons, uh, a product logo, uh, or packaging. And, you know, if you think of Apple, how they that Apple logo has been well known and the packaging for Apple was rather unique. Securing a superior location, developing a reputation for exceptional service. So Walmart, for example, is very keen on finding really good locations. Exceptional service. Um, certain restaurants will try to do this. Engaging in product redevelopment or improvement. So for example, taking the mousetrap and making it better or developing an effective advertising strategy. And a lot of companies we see have done that. And you, you know, think of the law firms. If you watch the news, for example, you'll see, see a lot of the local law firms advertising the news. And what do they try to do? You know, you, you say, well, Robach and Mackay, make the call, that sort of thing. They want to differentiate somehow or another because in Newfoundland, the market's so small, there's you know, there's a few firms out there. What's the difference between one lawyer and another? So what you can do is try to differentiate. So these, you know, these real imperfect competitive things rely on marketing. That's a, what it comes down to, really, is you need to be able to, to, to toot your horn in such a way that you can make your product feel different from that of any other product. So we see, for example, the logos, the brand names, the location, levels of service, product development, advertising. Um, I was thinking the weekend, you know, Aunt Sarah's Chocolate is a good one for a distinctive brand name. They got a nice little logo. Uh, their locations tend to be in tourist areas. Uh, they have a reasonably high degree of level of service. You're dealing one on one when you're digging out ice cream, and I know I bought enough of them. Um, they got interesting products. And if you're familiar with cows over in PEI or Halifax, you'll know that cows ice cream does the same. They have, you know, different types of variations on cow themed ice cream, Maui Cowie or Cowsicle or these sorts of things. And advertising, great deal of advertising. So we, we tend to see that in terms of these imperfect competitor firms. Now, this has created a lot of controversy out there in the world, too, because we have so many of these competitive firms, you know, or these imperfectly competitive firms, I should call it. We have so many of these that the way that they differentiate themselves largely is through advertising. So a lot of people have stood up and said, you know, let's look at the rights of this advertising stuff. And the, the people who support the advertising say, well, you know, it provides consumers with information. That's what advertising does. It's very much an informing tool. And consumers wouldn't know it was there unless unless they actually did the advertising. So that's a good thing. And you'll be able to pick one company from another based on what you know of them. So you have some degree of knowledge in order to make a decision. And, and because of that, really it kind of ups the competition level between the firms, which again helps the price. Because if, if you can have a very competitive environment, that means price becomes more mm, favorable to the consumer, we'll call it. And, and this is what we mean. It lowers the prices on products because people are competing more. And another big argument, and this is one that has proven out over the last number of years, is that finance, design line magazines and webs and TV shows, all the local papers in Newfoundland have died. You know, the, the, the packets of the world, the advertisers of the world, um, all of these types of local newspapers that were owned by Saltwater have all disappeared. And the reason they disappeared is that advertising for them dried up. People switched their advertising money to online platforms, such as Facebook. And as a result, they just could not make any money anymore. Now, that's, you know, that's unfortunate, but it is the way of the world. When we look at newspapers all over the world, they're in dire, dire they're facing dire challenges, while well, media all over the world is facing dire challenges because of the online environment. So, okay, so that's the positive things about advertising. What about some of the negative things? Well, you know, there's a lot of criticism about this type of environment, too, that relies on heavy advertising or a differentiated product. A lot of people argue that advertising is not informative. It's designed to get you to buy stuff, but it's not designed to inform you. 
And I think, you know, there's an argument to made for that if we look online or we look at this time of years with all the commercials on TV to buy this, buy that. Is it really information based for a consumer or is it designed for materialism? Is it designed to get people to buy garbage that they'll never use? You know, the Instapot, the best thing since sliced bread sits on your counter and you never use it. Uh, a lot of people argue that advertising is wasteful. And you think about all the ad signs and the you know visual, I call it the visual pollution that comes from advertising, be it in magazines or on billboards or out in the public or on TV or online. Um, a lot of people perceive it as being wasteful. And uh, others say, you know, because of this advertising, some companies succeed. The ones who can advertise really well succeed and the other ones fall by the wayside, which actually leads to increased concentration because if you got a few firms already and only a few advertise well, that means that everyone's going to go to the advertising company. The success of the advertising will lead to the demise of many firms. And then again, there's the argument that someone pays for this advertising. And guess who it is? It's usually the consumer. So there's an argument that because advertising exists, it actually causes prices to go up and that this is detrimental to the consumer. So again, you want to be aware that there are advantages espoused for advertising in this imperfectly competitive environment, and there are disadvantages or arguments against it. And you want to be aware of what those arguments are. Um, if we want to think about the monopolistically competitive market, we want to look at that first. There's four key characteristics of a monopolistically comparative, compar competitive industry that we want to be aware of, okay? Basically, the industry is made up of a lot of small firms. Um, you know, if there's over 100 firms vying for market share, no firm is dominating. Um, so you got these, I'm gonna call them medium-sized firms tend to be in this monopolistic competitive environment such as the law firms. So what you have is them trying to rise to, you know, they're all screaming for your attention because there's so many of them. There's a good freedom of entry and exit. Many manufacturers of other well-known products like John Deere and Everood entered the marketplace with their own offerings of snowmobiles in the 60s with higher oil prices in 73. They ditched it. Now there's only half a dozen manufacturers. So, you know, we saw that in that environment that existed in the 60s in the boom in snowmobiles, uh, when 1973, we had our first oil crisis, when, you know, if you're not familiar with it, the price of oil basically doubled overnight in 1973. It was a major shock to the system. And what it did is it changed the way the industry worked. So, for example, cars became more fuel efficient after that point in time, smaller. Uh, the Japanese really captured a large part of the American market. Um, we saw companies um, disappear who made things that really relied on uh, high fuel guzzling type products. And one of those was snowmobiles. Snowmobiles, two stroke engines, they're light, but they're awful on gas. And um, so people stopped buying those. And uh, as a result, the, the market dried up overnight. Um, in terms of a monopolistic competitive market, because the manufacturers are so competitive, they still have some degree over uh, some degree of price. They have some control over price because the number of manufacturers is not as big as it is in a purely competitive market. So we can argue that even though it might be small, they may have some degree of control. And the differentiated products things comes up. Competitors such as industry focus more on product development, innovation, and marketing to differentiate products. So the good thing is for a monopolistic competitive market is if you're going to try to distinguish your product from everyone else's in a small field, it does tend to focus your efforts and making yours stand out, be it through marketing or be it through product innovation or things like that, that, that could end up benefiting the customer. The oligopoly is uh, uh, a little bit tighter um, well, much tighter than the imperfect competition, okay? It's more on the monopolistic side. They can be found in industries that produce differentiated products and in industries that produce standardized products. So, again, 
it's a gray, it's a shade of gray difference between an oligopoly and an imperfectly competitive market. But the fact is, is that there is more, um, what I call more concentration in an oligopoly market. Examples of oligopoly industries in which products are differentiated are tobacco, breweries, automobiles, major appliances, electronic goods, and batteries. You got to imagine, you know, a lot of these things are pretty standard products. Beer, tobacco, cars, appliances, most fridges look the same. Different manufacturers' names on them, but they pretty well look and operate the same. Most electronic goods, same thing. Batteries, ABC cells, maybe D cells. I don't see too many D cells anymore, but the fact is, is that batteries are pretty much standard. So when you get that ever ready money or Duracell copper top, that is really designed to differentiate your product from someone else's. Um, examples in industries in which a few firms produce a standardized product could be like steel, aluminum. So we got commodities going on here. You know, it's basically the same product. And unfortunately, you know, Newfoundland is very much an oligopoly type. There's a lot of oligopoly type businesses operating in Newfoundland, and they tend to be making standardized products, such as oil, uh, lumber, pulp and paper these sorts of things. If we look at the basic characteristics of an oligopoly, this is an important thing to know. There's five basic things that stand out in terms of telling you that this is an oligopoly. The first one is that it's dominated by very few large firms. So you got a lot of big companies in there. Um, entry can be difficult because it tends to be very high cost to get into the business. There's non-price competition between the firms widely practiced. So non-price competition really involves product differentiation. My product's different than yours, and telling consumer that. Each has a fair degree of control over the price because, again, it's more of a monopoly than anything else. So they have a high degree of control. There's only three or four sellers. And there is some sort of mutual interdependence existing between the firms. Uh, seeing there's so few of them, if one can't do it, they have to rely on the other one to do it. So the airline, if you miss a flight, for example, they'll put you on the other airline. <clears throat> One of the things that you should be aware of in order to be able to judge how, how if something is more of an oligopoly or more of a monopolistic competitive is the amount of what's called concentration. And the term is used to reflect the percentage of the business, of the industry, I should say, the percentage of the industry that is made up by the top, let's say, four firms. Okay, so what we're looking at is let's look at any industry, the airlines, for example. And you ask, what are the biggest four firms in that industry in Canada? Okay, we need to be able to kind of focus it for a region. So we say, okay, well, there's uh, Air Canada is the largest, WestJet, Porter, and there's regional carriers such as. Uh, such as Buffalo Airways up north, or such as uh, such as uh, PAL here in Newfoundland. You know, there there are other ones. So we look at those and we ask ourselves, how much of the toll industry of all the businesses that are airlines of the toll, how much of it do they own? The top four, and you'll get a percentage: eighty percent, ninety percent, fifty percent, ninety-five percent. This is what's known as the concentration ratio, okay? And all it does is it measures the percentage of the industry's total sales that are made up by the largest few firms. And we're going to say four, the largest four. So high concentration ratios often occur when large output levels are required for a firm to capture economies of scale. Now, if you're aware of what's going on with Rogers, I don't know if you're aware of what's in the news now, the board of Rogers were having some controversial uh, fuss um, over the last number of weeks. A court has ruled on it, and the, the Ted Rogers, who owned the company and started the company, Cable TV Empire, um, uh, died, and the son took over, and basically the mother and the son have been squabbling over who should control it. The son won. But anyway, one of the things that Rogers is trying to do is to buy Shaw Communications in Ontario. So the, the thing is, is that it's a pretty much of an oligopoly industry anyway, or, you know, highly, it's a highly concentrated industry, this cable TV business in Canada. 
and and it's it's morphed into telephone service now telephony service for example eastlink is a relatively small player but eastlink is one of them rogers is just trying to buy shaw so actually one of the large players in the industry is trying to buy the other large player in the industry so shaw is fairly big rogers fairly big when they come together as one you will have an even more concentrated industry so the thing is when we think about from a consumer point of view concentration concentration ratios are important because what they'll tell you is who controls the industry and in the case of cable television or i'm going to call it uh, uh, wireless communications now uh, these uh, rogers and, and shaw it's a fairly concentrated industry is going to get more concentrated and the only one's going to lose there is going to be the consumer because when you get less competition prices tend to go up so this is what we're looking at potentially in Canada right now if Rogers can can take over Shaw. So, so well, uh, here's an example of this issue of concentration ratio. Suppose that a combined sales revenue of the four biggest firms in the asphalt industry is $320 million and the total sales revenue for the entire industry is $400 million. So the top four firms are generating $320 million of the $400 million that there is to produce. So effectively, 80%, if we do the 320 divided by 400, 80% of the asphalt industry is owned by the largest four firms. Very highly concentrated business. So <clears throat> here's a test your understanding here in order to calculate this concentration ratio. The Canadian agreement industry consists of 10 companies whose annual sales are shown to the right. So we've got a bunch of companies there. And you can see, um, see, we've got the top four is A, B, C, and D. And calculate the concentration ratio. Well, let, let's see. So there's 22 and 6 is 28 and 17 is uh, 30, 45, 57, 65, 80. 12 is 92 so there's 92 million dollars in sales that's my cap that's my count now 92 million in total sales okay so there's 92 million in total sales here so just all it does that all these up that's 92 million and let's look at the top four 22 and 6 is 28 and 17 is 45 57 so 57 of 92 so if we did the math on that we could calculate the concentration ratio so 57 divided by 92 is about 62 percent so the concentration ratio on that is 62 percent of the industry by the top four firms uh in, in what type of market does growing industry operate well we're really thinking of a, more of an oligopoly because the fact is that the top four firms have 62% of the total industry. Okay. Now, here is the problem that arises out of um, out of this, and that is there's a temptation to collude because there are so few businesses in the oligopoly. Let's assume that there's only 12 firms operating, okay? If they compete against one another and they product differentiate against one another, obviously someone's gonna win and someone's gonna lose. And we think that, you know, that's, that's good. I suppose that's good for the winners, not so good for the losers. And if, there were fewer of them, it wouldn't be so good for consumers. But the fact of the matter is, if you're the chief executive officer of those firms, there is an incentive for you not to compete, meaning that if you could shear up your share of the business, if you're happy with your share, and if you know, everyone promised not to compete with one another, you can make a fair dollar. Either one of those firms could make a fair dollar. So it really pays for oligopolies to cooperate because they can make more profit by doing that. So cooperation amongst the rivals that we normally would consider to be rivals would be a good thing for industry. 
not a good thing for consumers. So this is known as collusion. Whenever the industry players get together and say, let's not compete against one another, guys. Let's just make a pile of money by agreeing to share up our each collective share of the business, jack up prices, and make a fortune. So oligopoly firms sometimes collude in order to avoid the risk of a price war. And a price war means that effectively, I lower my price, you lower your price, they lower their price, I lower my price, you lower. It's basically a race to the bottom, right? So we run into a situation where we're all losers if we go into a price war. So what the government has done is, and legislation has said, is that firms are not allowed to do this. They're not allowed to collude. So illegal agreements, these agreements to collude are illegal. And they're seldom long lasting either because the fact is that someone's going to break the rules and say, I have an opportunity to make more money here. In the world, we know these collusions as cartels. Cartels are effectively a bunch of firms who have a big share of the market and gotten together and agreed not to compete against one another. And OPEC is a really good example. The Organization of Petroleum Expert and Companies is a really good example of that. And they're the ones that are really working very hard now to keep prices of oil up by saying, let's not produce any more. You don't produce more than I do. I don't produce, keep the production levels down. That will keep prices high. 